Good morning, and can I welcome you to this meeting of Mid Suffolk uh, District Council Development Control Committee A. Um, first of all, I just need to remind you some of the domestic, domestic arrangements for today. Can I ask that when you please uh, ensure that microphones are muted and cameras are turned off when you're not speaking, and please do not interrupt other speakers when they are speaking. Members are reminded not to use the messaging or chat function during the meetings unless it is to report a pecuniary or non-pecuniary interest or to notify myself that you wish to make a proposal. Members are reminded that they should not have alternative communi communication lines open, such as Skype chat, and that if you are contacted by a third party during the application, you should bring this to the attention of the legal advisor who is with us. Uh, if you are attending the meeting to speak and persistently interrupt the meeting, we may have to ask you to leave. Additionally, ask questions by myself to the meeting, please use the hands up function. If you're experiencing poor connection issues, in the first instance, please just try turning off your camera. If this does not work, uh, please turn off all incoming video. Uh, these options can be found on the three little dots, uh, which are part of the Teams uh, layout uh, next to the hand function on the information bar. I'd like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. The whole of the meeting will be recorded, except where there are confidential or exempt items. If you make a representation to the meeting, you'll be deemed by the council to have consented to being recorded. By entering this meeting as a speaker, you are also consenting to being recorded by the council and to the possible use of those sound recordings for webcasting and or training purposes. The Council, members of the public and press may record, film, photograph or broadcast this meeting when the public and press are not lawfully excluded. So I'd just like to uh, do some introductions. As I said, uh, we have uh, Ian Deprez, who is our legal advisor with us, Robert Carmichael, the governance officer, John Pateman G, the area planning manager, uh, Alex Scott, who is a case officer, and we will have some ward members who at Mid Suffolk District Council can speak on an application uh, within their ward, but may not vote on it. OK, uh, so can I move on to the agenda, please? And agenda item number one, uh, I will now ask the governance officer to roll call for the members present, please. Thank you, Chair. So if members could please respond with uh, either good morning or present. So Councillor Rachel Eburn. Present. Councillor John Field. Present. Councillor Matthew Hicks. Present. Councillor Sarah Mansell. Present. Councillor John Matheson. Present. Councillor Richard Mayer. Present. Councillor Dave Muller. Present. Councillor Tim Passmore. Morning. And then for the ward members, we have Councillor Andrew Mellon. Present. Councillor Helen Geek. Present. And Councillor Sarah Mansell is already on the committee, so um, already noted. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, do we need to receive any declarations of pecuniary or non pecuniary interest by members? Now, I would just like to. Horn is speaking on behalf of one of the applica applicants, and obviously Mr. Horn was a district councillor uh, in in a previous administration. So uh, there is just just to declare that I think is worth noting. Any other declarations of pecuniary or non-pecuniary interest by members, uh, Councillor Matheson? Yeah, I've advised officers um, of a non-pecuniary interest regarding the um, Elms Will application just for the record um good morning um chairman uh councillors this is the legal advisory in the pray just to say councillor matheson has indeed made me and the monetary officer known uh, uh, this matter known to, to us and it is it is the monetary officer and i agree it's a non-pecuniary interest based on old um acquaintanceship and and and, and um friendship which is, is no more than a non-pecuniary interest that's properly declared as such OK, and why are you there, Mr. Deprez? Obviously, uh, just Mr. Horn was a district councillor, so it's uh, familiar to many of us. Is that uh, is that worth noting? Uh, worth noting that it, I, I dare say um, 
Oh, he, he didn't seek re-election, did he, a year ago? Yeah. So the newer yeah. members of the committee won't have known him regardless that's of it. political affiliation. But oh, some of the long-standing members will have known him indeed. And that's that can be noted. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, any other declarations of pecuniary or non-pecuniary interest by members? Nope. OK, thank you. Uh, agenda, might, agenda item number three is declarations of lobbying. Um, are there any to declare? Now, I suspect we've all um, had the same ones, but let's start uh, with the order of the hands up and just see. Uh, first up is uh, Councillor Mansell. Uh, hello. Uh, yes, I have been lobbied on the Elmswell um, application. I've been contacted by, by both the applicant and the objector. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Matheson. Microphone. I, I've been lobbied regarding the um, Elmswell application also. Thank you. And Councillor Eburn? Um, Elm, Elmswell one, but I, said, I thought we all worked. So we went to the planning committee, but um, the Elmswell application. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say we've all had a uh, an email uh, has gone to all members of the committee uh, regarding hedgerows in Elmswell. So um, I think that's noted for all of us. OK, any anything else uh, on that front that anyone wishes to declare uh, regarding lobbying? No. Nope. OK, thank you very much. Uh, agenda item number four is declarations of personal site visits. Do we have any? Uh, Councillor Mansell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, I. I did make a um, cycle ride past the application in Wyverston uh, the other day to go and look at, at where it was. Uh, and just to put the record straight, the site in Elmswell is about 400 metres from where I live, and I probably pass it at least three times a week. OK, thank you. That's noted. Any other personal site visits? No. Nope. OK, thank you. Uh, next agenda item number four is confirmation of the minutes of the meeting that were held on the 22nd of July. Um, are there any points regarding the accuracy of the minutes that start on page uh, seven of our papers and run through to page 11? No, OK. Uh, can I have a proposer uh, that we accept the minutes, please? Thank you. Uh, uh, it was proposed by, I'll just do it in the order the hands went up, proposed by Councillor Muller, seconded by Councillor Matheson. Uh, can the governance officer therefore please now take a roll call vote? Sorry about that. So um, if you could please respond with for, against or abstain. So Councillor Rachel Eburn. Uh, abstain. I wasn't there. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor John Field. Four. Councillor Matthew Hicks. Four. Councillor Sarah Mansell. Four. Councillor John Matheson. Four. Councillor Richard Mayer. Four. Councillor Dave Muller. Four. And Councillor Tim Passmore. Uh, abstention because I wasn't on the committee at the time. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Chair. That is carried. Lovely. Thank you, members. Sorry, Matthew. Yes. Sorry, Rick Mayer here. Um, apologies. I should have um, declared a site visit to the Wyverston. Um, OK. Thank you, for, thank you for notifying us that. We'll put it on the record. Thank you. OK, so the minutes of the meeting have now been confirmed and we will get them signed at the next practical opportunity. OK, thank you for that. Uh, agenda item number six is to receive notification of petitions in accordance with the council's petition scheme. Do we have any, please? None received, Chair. None received. Thank you very much. OK, we now move on to the schedule of planning applications. I intend to stay in the order in which they are in the papers. The first application before us is DC 19-01876, Hedgerows Grove Lane, Elmswell. And I will invite the case officer, John Pateman Dree, to please introduce the application to the committee. Morning. Just bear with me. This is all freezing up now. This is always good timing. I'll give you to bear with me one moment. So can you see that I'm sharing? That's great. Okay. 
We can, but it's not in presentation mode. It's in. Uh, yeah, I can't. It's. Just push. There you go. There you go. Perfect. Right, super. <laughs> Uh, oh, so hang on one moment. This is freezing. I've just realised something. Just bear with me one moment. I apologise for this. Why is it not doing that? Can you just give me one moment? I'm just trying to reset it and start again. Right, let's try that again. Let's go back in there. Right, okay. So that's still not changed. See, ah, seems okay. to have a massive delay. I do apologise, members. I don't know if that's coming across in any other way. Hopefully, you can now see this yeah. PowerPoint uh, presentation. So this is uh, application DC 19 of 1876, Hedgerows Grove Lane, uh, Elmswell. Um, this is an application with all matters reserved except for access. Uh, this is an application for the erection of two detached bungalows and a vehicular access. So this application sets the number of doors are single story, but appearance uh, and as well as the access but appearance layout landscaping scale our reserve matters are not part of this application before us today the site is north of elmswell it's a very sustainable location uh, with a range of services within the settlement itself the site is off grove lane um, if you can see my cursor so we have ashfield road going uh, out from the north of elmswell and this is Grove Lane coming across here. The site is just in here. Um, it is beyond the settlement boundary. It is countryside in planning terms and via the local plan, uh, but it has no other designations. Um, this, by the way, is uh, an airfield, I believe. Closer in, we find Grove Lane, and we find the site itself. This is Hedgerows, just on the left here. This is Half Acre, a modest cottage on the on the right. On the opposite side of the road, uh, we have uh, Grove Farm, which is a listed two-storey property. Hedgerows itself is a bungalow. So the official site in red, and other ownership is in blue, which is this L-shaped piece of land here, and the squarish piece of land here. This is Hedgerows itself. And the list of buildings is just shown on this uh, constraints map uh, on the opposite side of the road. So the site is set back from the road, um, essentially behind Hedgerows and uh, behind the planning permission DC 1802553. Uh, so that earlier permission for outline was granted for two bungalows within this area here oh sorry it's gone back one well, within this area here the site is behind that one so essentially uh, if we were to approve two bungalows in this area or in total in this whole site the access uh, which is part of this application was also part of the application for this outline and was granted. That includes the visibility displays associated with that access and it would include the removal in part of some of the vegetation along the frontage of this site. Uh, for the avoidance of doubt, the site we are considering before us is agricultural land. There are a number of public rights of way uh, in the area. These are shown on this plan in, in a red dotted line. Um, and the settlement boundary of Elmswell is shown in this blue line here. The public footpaths 
the network in various places. There may be more actually beyond the ones I'm just showing, but I was just showing the ones between Elmswell and uh, the site itself. Um, these are not lit and it is agreed that they may be unsuitable in winter time. It is not envisaged these routes would be the main choice of travel compared to a car, but they are available as a choice um, as they were for the two bungalows already approved. So the group of dwellings uh, that we're looking at over a kilometre away from the settlement boundary by road, or just under a kilometre if we um, services within the, dis, uh, the settlement itself range from different distances, so they are obviously further than a kilometre away. As for noting as well, we have various existing pockets of development along um, Ashfield Road, uh, Oak Lane and, and so on. Uh, we also have uh, permission for more housing uh, to infill along Ashfield Road. So the site itself is a agricultural field. Um, well enclosed and well, this is the frontage of the site. Um, in different seasons, obviously that would look different. Um, third parties have mentioned the former medieval green and historic landscape, and it is mentioned in documents such as the Heritage and Settlement Sensitivity Assessment for Baybo and Midsburg District Councils, uh, which is March 2018, which is an evidence document for the emerging local plan. The area uh, the green uh, used to cover is on screen. Um, section 8 of my report covers this uh, particular point in detail. It was not a consideration that led to direct refusals of applications on its own, uh, including the front bungalows approved in August 2018. But it was a matter that has been considered as part of a refusal to the setting of listed buildings in one known case. However, in that case, which was for Dagwood Farm, it was confirmed that the green is not regarded as a non-designated asset. So to conclude, policies such as CS5, CS1 and 2, H7 are upheld as out of date against the NPPF, regardless of the council having a five year housing supply. The Warpit Appeal and others since have established this and so full weight cannot be given to these policies. With consideration of policies such as H13, H15, GP1, H16 and various elements of the NPPF, the proposal is a small enclosed pocket of existing and approved development identifiable as not being an open countryside. It is a very small scale development, both in number and density and nature being single storey. Single story would be in keeping with hedgerows and the two bungalows already approved on the frontage of the site. There will be the removal of some vegetation along the frontage, but it is considered material that this authority has already approved this removal via the previous application for the same access. The extensive landscape features are a benefit and allow this site to be non-intrusive to the wider open countryside and contained between the two existing dwellings and form a cluster with the already approved bungalows. The recommendation is one of approval and with conditions, including conditions for biodiversity and renewable energy integration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions. Can you just, uh, we've all received an email uh, regarding the judicial review. Yes. Uh, and uh, we've been told there are five gra separate grounds for a refusal, I believe, or five separate grounds that have been looked at. Can we just talk us through the relevance of that to what's before us now and, and how we have to, if, what weight or if any we have to give that? Um, so this application has been with us for a little while on the basis that it was first determined um, a little while ago um, and it was delegated as approval. Unfortunately, uh, it was realised that the case officer at the time had not put the site notice up uh, at the right time and therefore the site notice hadn't expired when that decision was made. 
So therefore, uh, it went through the judicial review process and uh, was effectively made live again uh, because it was obviously uh, prejudicial to other people have not having the chance to uh, uh, reply and make representation because the site notice had not expired yet. That of all the other grounds that I mentioned there was the only one that was the judicial review was predicated on. So that setting to one side um, was the issue dealt with then and it doesn't make it has no bearing on the material considerations of the application before members today. Okay so the only consideration for us is the, the fact that the application uh, was ineffectively was, was not timed correctly in terms of the site notice therefore the application has been resubmitted in effect. In effect, so it, uh, the, the decision was squashed um, and therefore it becomes a live application again and therefore we've obviously, you know, uh, taken uh, more time and we have agreed as part of that process to present it to committee to ensure that it's an open and transparent process. Um, that is why it's before uh, mm -hmm. members, I should have said that at the beginning, I do apologise, because um, obviously normally an application like this would not be uh, for members um, unless called in by members. Um, so ultimately that is where we are here. I don't know if, if uh, uh, yep. Ian Dupree wishes to comment any further, but I... I it, Ian, it, would you like Mr. Well, Price, you want to comment? Not, I don't need to add much, Chairman. John has said most of what's necessary. That I, I don't, if There may have been a recent email just to members that I hadn't seen. I don't need to hold things up by saying I want to read it this minute if, that, if that's the case. But yeah, there was the de there was a delegated decision under delegated powers that um, unfortunately, as John has said, there was a procedural error, an undeniable procedural error. There was a judicial review brought on five grounds. Um, first, basically the judicial review was, com as it often, often happens, there's, the judicial review was compromised by a consent order. The one ground where the council had to acknowledge there was an undeniable error um, was was the the um, the, the, uh, fa the, the do, making the decision too soon in in, in putting it in crude, crude plain English. The there were four other grounds of challenge that broadly speaking can be characterised as the claimant saying, even if it was in time, I still think it's a legally wrong decision. And in what that often happens, the consent order basically said they don't need to be determined now. Um, the, sometimes a party insists on taking a case to court because they want to argue those points, but that didn't happen. Uh, often well, the court time doesn't need to be taken up where there is an agreement on one essential point. In that case, reserve their position for later if necessary. And the um, th those are matters for, but yes, it's being presented to you as a new application. So the, 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 the um, decision that's been um, quashed is has gone and, and we're, we're back to square one as it were so i think i think that hopefully that make, makes things clear okay thank you and i'm just sorry if i can uh, just uh, there are no other hands up so i'll just keep asking some questions i've got so uh, the entrance to the site um has already been determined by the fact that there are two bungalows with permission granted on the right hand side between uh which you talked about earlier so does that mean actually we, there's nothing we can do in terms no. of the entrance and the access because that's predetermined. I want no, no, no. I want to be very careful here. Yeah, um, that's what I'm trying to just clarify. The application before you includes access, so it is to be judged on its individual merits as an access um, yeah. and as part of the application before you. It is not a reserved matter, so you are considering access as part of the debate today. Um, however. I would uh, recommend that members do consider that the previous approval, which has an access in the precise same location and with the same visibility displays, as a material consideration to be given significant weight. Uh, the basis that that has moved in that location and uh, is approved for uh, the visibility displays um, it, that we will remove vegetation as necessary. So, you know, bear in mind then that, you know, if reserve matters came forward with the other application and were approved, they could go ahead and, and do the works and the access um, as, as we've effectively got in front of us. But we need to be very careful. It, it, is, it is a separate application. Um, yep. This is a separate proposal and it does need to be judged on its own merits as well. But I would okay. say that there is a material weight with the other application to be considered. Thank you. That's very helpful. 
Uh, okay, uh, Councillor Matheson. Thank you. Uh, two questions. Firstly, um, can you show us and, and tell us the width of the road, um, Grove Lane? And second question, can you tell us about the age of the um, the, the pasture, the grassland, um, which the site comprises? Um, the answer we know for both of those, um, I can show you Grove Lane, uh, but I, I don't have the ability to measure it accurately because it's a rural lane which has varying widths all the way along it and it has various differences in, in highway verge. So to take a specific point along there would be inappropriate and unreasonable to do so. In terms of the pasture land, I have no idea how old uh, that area is. Um, uh, it could be yesterday that grass grew on it. It could be, how, where do we, where are we taking age from in terms of its existence, in terms of boundaries? I, I don't know. So I, I, I can't answer that either. It is indeed part of the former medieval green, um, which is many hundreds of years old. Um, and, um, you know, that's, uh, I think I've put that in the report on section eight uh, that talks about I think there was a date there, but I, I can't get back to my report to look at it for the moment. Um, but the, you know, so I, I would have no doubt that there is, we're not denying there is historic landscape uh, in the context of the the site. Um, and that, that that's uh, for the record. Thank you. Yeah, I was asking more in terms of biodiversity than, I mean, I quite agree that the, um, the medieval green argument, and I used to live on it, <laughs> is, um, uh, it doesn't hold much water at all. Can I just say, John, that's expressing an opinion. At this stage, we're only asking points of clarity. It's not, we're not in debate, please. Uh, have you got any other questions, John? Uh, sorry, Miss Councillor Matheson. No, those were the two. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Councillor Eburn. Oh, thank you, Chair, and th thank you, John, for that um, presentation. Um, I've got two questions, if I may. Could you tell me the distance from the site to the co-op um, in the centre of Elmsell, please? And secondly, um, could you tell me how far along the road, or show me on a on a map, so if, if someone was, say, walking in winter to the co-op, how far they'd have to walk before they get to a... Um, a footway, a paved footway, or, or effectively where does the paved footway start in Elmswell? Thank you. Um, right, I can't measure while I'm in presentation mode. I'd have to switch over because um, unfortunately we don't have paper anymore, so I can't sit and uh, measure that. Uh, but I can I can do that offline in a moment and come back to you on that one. Uh, Thanks, but in John, term, would you, uh, just while you're on that map, would you be able to point out the, the co-op co -op here? It's just a I bit further was, south, I think. Because you've got the railway, yeah, and I thought there was a convenience store in here somewhere. Yeah, and the co-op's just the south side of the railway. Okay, yeah, so that's here it, somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in terms of um, paved, uh, it is paved to roughly about this point here. I don't believe it's paved beyond there, and it is not paved along Grove Lane itself. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Muller. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Eburns actually just asked a question I was going to ask, uh, Chair. Thank you. No problem. Councillor Mayor. Thank you. Uh, John, can you um, comment on the Parish Council's uh, position that reliance on the concept of tilted balance is insupportable as the development plan is clearly breached? Is the tilted so... balance okay? OK, <laughs> um, so we have uh, the, the local plan um, and we it is considered to be out of date in the context of the NPPF. So we've got the local plan 1998 and we have other documents that came before the NPPF, which was 2012 onwards. Um, and we look at the, the NPPF, we, it essentially says if you don't have an up to date local plan, um, it is not full weight. Now, this was tried and tested the wall pit appeal uh, that we, we all know um, and from that point onwards it's been very clearly established that we have to be out of date and therefore should be given less weight and that includes uh, the 
housing supply policies um, of the council and the so as we are deemed to be out of way date ugh, um, we do we and we have a five year housing supply now you know, we used to be out of date we didn't have a five year housing supply uh, we do have a housing supply but we you know so we have more weight that we can give to our local uh, plan policies but we can't give them absolute weight on the basis that they're still out of date by the NPPF um, therefore there is a uh, tilted balance in respect of um, uh, in favour of sustainable development um, and that is the debate uh, that you are as members uh, needing to grapple with in terms of you know is this sustainable and does it uh, cause demonstrous harm um, and I that, that's where we in this summary and it's very hard to summary, summarize all of that in, in a very quick way uh, is the position we have I appreciate the parish council feel that the neighbor uh, the local plan should be given far more weight and the development plan is given weight uh, but um, it is a judgment of how much weight to give it um, by being out of debt you know, it is the discretion of members how much weight they give the the local plan in context with the NPPF but um, we don't advise to give it full weight uh, on the basis of, of our current position and the age of it. Lovely thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Mansell. Uh, thank you Chair. Um, if I may I could answer Councillor Eburn's questions about the distances. Uh, well have you got there? I, I know what they are because I've measured them in advance of the meeting. OK, yeah. um, it is one point eight kilometres from the site to Elmswell Co-op. Can you give that in miles for those that well, are miles? Uh, one point six kilometres is a mile, so it's about a mile and a bit. Thank you. Um, and it is eight hundred metres to the start of the pavement, which starts at the um, junction of Oak Lane and yeah. Lashfield Road. So the footpath that is marked as a Black, uh, red dotted line on the current presentation comes out onto Ashfield Road uh, a little bit way north of Oak Lane so there is a little bit of road without a pavement even if you go on the footpath route. Okay thank you for that Use, very useful thank you. Okay any other questions for points of clarity at this point before we move on? Nope okay uh, so we now move on to the public speakers uh, we have Mr Peter Dow from the Parish Council uh, we do ask you to keep to three minutes, please. Um, and if you'd like to turn your camera on and your microphone on. Do you want me to close the presentation? Yes, to allow? Yep. Yeah. Um, if I can. Mr. Dow, if you could Are turn you your. Am I with you? Yep, there, that's good. OK, and uh, we'll just make sure everyone, else, if you'd like to start and when you start, you have up to three minutes. Thank and you, John, if you can just go to mute. Yeah, sorry. OK, Mr. Dow, when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, the judicial review allows what Elmsville Parish Council considers to be a welcome pause. It's accepted by your officers as a new application and that we're back to square one. It also gives a very detailed analysis of the basis of the officer's decision. It clearly identifies the shortcomings in the reasoning that inform that decision. And Elmsley Parish Council welcomes the chance of a more mature and informed view from members rather than that of a single original case officer. The conclusions reached vindicate what Elmsley Parish Council and many others have argued time and time again in attempting to have proper weight accorded to local development plan policies. The blanket assumption within the approval decision was that the authorities' development plan policies are out of date uh, and we've just heard that they can be given either more weight or absolute weight and this is down to the judgment of members. There is no dispute that the application site is in the countryside. There is no dispute that the application site is not curtilage, but agricultural land. There is no dispute, as members will know, that the road giving immediate access is a single track lane with passing places serving the industrial estate, which houses H.G. Wilson's giant lorries and other HGV operators. There is no dispute 
the pedestrian access beyond Grove Lane towards the village is a long and fast and busy Ashfield Road with no pavement until the outskirts of the village are reach. And there's no dispute, the pedestrian route is far longer than that suggested in the original officer's report, and Councillor Mansell has addressed this. There is furthermore no dispute that the historical dimension of this landscape on the ancient Buttonhall Green must suffer if this development requires more loss of mature hedgerow, which you may decide it might well do. What Elmsford Parish Council does dispute is the officer's contention that the tilted balance test within P NPPF needs to take no account of the undisputed negatives I've just listed. These are set against the annoyingly ill-considered suggestion that another two car-bound dwellings in our countryside will support the vitality and viability of our village. Our well-documented vitality and our proven viability are well supported and in the process of being well augmented by virtue of a 47% uplift in housing stock already on the way. In short, this proposal is yet another imposition on our threat. Freed from the wrongful assertions and assumptions of the original officer's report, we ask members to refuse this application. As a postscript, it is suggested that the previous lack of perspective and poor practice has already cost the authority nine and a half thousand pounds plus its own considerable costs. Members, if not fully convinced that refusal is right on a double or quits basis, could refuse permission and should the applicant strive to appeal, allow an inspector the chance to make what would be for our communities an historic ruling. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dow. Do we have any questions for Mr. Dow, please, or the parish council? Can I have a point yes. of order, if I may? Yes, of course. Um, in respect of the report, the original case officer was not myself, and the report uh, was dealt with at the time. Uh, is not the report before members today. So any issues in respect of the original case officer's report are not part of the discussion and not part of the uh, debate. Ultimately, your members are to consider the recommendation of officers before you today, which is what is in your papers. And I just want to make sure that's very clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor so, Muller. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Dow, um, question. You mentioned the industrial estate at the end of Grove Lane. Um, how many movements approximately each day are they with these HGV vehicles um, going down and back and forth on uh, Grove Lane, please? We don't have a traffic count on Grove Lane, but as Councillor Mansell, as a close neighbour, will confirm, it is many, many dozens of movements. And I think a very important point is the size of the vehicles that are using that. Uh, I've been at several site meetings with members where they've been very aware of the size of H.C. Wilson's 20 rear steer super lorries. And they have to go in and out every day for H.C. Wilson to operate. Thank you, Mr. Dow. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Field. This, just a quick check. Mr. Dow referred to a single track road, uh, which presumably supports all these massive lorries. Uh, is that the road I saw a photograph of during the presentation? Because the photograph seemed to show something which was uh, one heck of a lot wider than the village road i'm sitting next to at the moment it seemed to be anything but a single john, track can you just you confirm uh, it? yes so uh john Payman G, can you just confirm the picture you put up was that the same road that is grove lane yes yes thank you grove, so, grove lane is a um a two-way road it, 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 it's a rural road and i you know two lorries going past each other might have difficulties along parts of it but um, certainly at the point of the access for this site it is clearly to a uh, lane. Okay so it's a varying road in width as you go along it. Okay. Yeah, it's it is uh, you know uh, uh, possibly people will be criticised for saying it's two lane. It, it you know it, it does vary. It's a rural road uh, with different characteristics so all the way along. Two, so it varies along the width of the road. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Councillor Field? 
Well, sort of, sort of. I see Mr. Dow shaking his head, but uh, it does seem to be physically uh, a lot uh, wider. Yeah. So than I think that the thing is, it's in, it varies in parts. OK, any other questions for the parish council? No. OK, thank you very much, Mr. Dow. Thank you for joining us today. Um, OK, so we'll now move on. Uh, uh, we now have the opportunity to ask an objector to speak. Uh, I have uh, Rob Sherwood and Ellen Whitchurch who would like to speak. Uh, if you turn your cameras on and your microphones on, please. Thank you and welcome. And again, uh, you have up to three minutes. Uh, good morning, Chairman and Committee members. I'm Rob Sherwood. <clears throat> I live next door to Hedgerows at Half Acre. I came to live here with my family in 1954, aged seven, and I returned to live here nearly 20 years ago. <clears throat> my childhood memory of this field periodically blissfully grazed by a mixed herd of dairy cows. Uh, more recently, horses were kept in the field. I appreciate there is a real need for more housing, good housing everywhere in Mid Suffolk has now secured its five year housing land supply. And it seems that Elmswell has already made a substantial contribution to this objective. So additional proposals for housing, contrary to the development plan, must be given very careful consideration rather than pursuing an automatic presumption in favour of development. When the planning department granted permission for the first two bungalows on part of the field fronting Grove Lane, I believe they were misguided and that the site was incorrectly described as garden. The designated lawful agricultural use wasn't mentioned and there was no recognition of its character, its part in the historic landscape, or even its true distance from the village facilities. The application before you now relates to a part of the field further away from the road. I would not wish the misunderstandings that may have led to the first application being approved to be repeated, compounding the error. I greatly appreciate that this new report has responded in more detail to many of my objections. I would like these to be considered along with all the other issues, including the loss of possibly the last hedged feudal field in the length of Grove Lane, the further loss of visual character and protected natural habitat of the enclosed pasture, the further erosion of our connection to remnants of a local historic landscape and Button Hall Green, the very limited economic, social or environmental benefits to the village, the poor sustainability of two more homes with diff difficult access to village facilities without using a car and recognising and giving greater weight to the opinions of those who understand and value the local area, for example, the Elmsall Parish Council and the Suffolk Preservation Society. I believe that it is not appropriate to develop this site, and I hope that after balancing all the issues, you will reach the same view. If, however, at the end of your considerations, you are minded to grant permission, I ask that you mitigate its impact in some way by applying suitable conditions. This would ensure that this unique site is at least an exemplary development of eco-design principles, for example, as could be achieved by a passive house plus specification, which could plot in net zero energy living and with the buildings sympathetically integrated into the natural landscape. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Sherwood. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, Councillor Masson and Councillor Field. Yeah, thank you. Could you help us uh, on the question that I asked earlier regarding the age of the pasture? In, in your knowledge? Well, in my knowledge, it has always been pasture. Um, obviously, I've not been here every day of the last, since I, I was first here in 1954, but the Rushbrook, the farmers who were here quite a while before we moved here, um, they always had it in their grazing rotation um, for as long as they were here. So it's probably been uncultivated for hundreds of years. I've no proof of that. Um, okay. But uh, 
I've no reason to believe anything other than that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Field. Thank you, uh, Mr Sherwood. Uh, we, we've heard much of the distance to the amenities in, in Elmswell. Uh, since you're a neighbour, I wonder, could I just ask, is it possible to use sustainable means to get to those um, amenities? Uh, do you walk or cycle or do you use a car always? Well, um, I have to say I always use my car. I, I do have a, a walking problem. I had a spinal fracture um, quite a few years ago, and this um, made it impossible for me to use footpaths without a great deal of pain. And um, obviously, I'm a bit wobbly on my feet. It, 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 Grove Lane is a dangerous road. I mean, I have to say, and I, and I know one other person, I won't name them, who, like myself, was walking in Grove Lane and was actually, my jacket was brushed by a passing commercial vehicle. This was a few years ago. Some of the drivers are very considerate, but there are quite a few um, who do not respect the speed limit, and they do not seem to respect the fact it's a narrow country lane. Yeah, thank you. So, thank you. Okay, um, any other questions at all for Mr Sherwood? Nope. OK, thank you very much can for I, joining us. Can I, can, I, can I make a point about the, no. the, the vehicles? In no, place? I'm sorry, you, you, I, you cannot. No, I'm sorry, you, you don't uh, have an opportunity to come back. I'm sorry. I understand. OK, fair enough. Thank you. Um, OK, so next we move. Uh, we now uh, we don't have a supporter uh, who would like to speak. We do have the applicant who would like to speak, uh, David Barker. So, Mr Barker, if you could please turn on your microphone and your camera. And again, you have three minutes to address the committee. Hello, can you hear me OK? We can. We can. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Good morning. Um, we have proposed bungalows because there are house time needed locally and because this reduces the impact on the neighbours and the surrounding area. Bungalows are rarely provided on larger developments. The vehicular access has been kept to a single access in the centre of our client's property, so it's not on the boundary with the neighbour where it could cause them disturbance or affect the boundary trees. Our client's family lives in Wilpit, Elmswell, and my office and home are in the same area. The Thurston, Elmswell, Wilpit and Hawley area is a sustainable one with a great many facilities that serve almost all day-to-day -day needs. The application site is well placed in this area and so is more sustainable than much of the wider district of Mid Suffolk. On a very nearby site with the same policy considerations at the junction of Grove Lane and Ashfield Road, seven homes have been approved locally and at appeal, including one less than a year ago. Our site is better screened and less prominent than the nearby site for seven homes. Our clients have approval for two bungalows on the frontage of their plot. This creates a good precedent for the two bungalows in this application. An application for reserved matters for the bungalows on the front and in this application will be designed together so they can come forward as a comprehensive development. There are no objections from professional consultees, including highways officers. I know Grave Lane well and it can easily accommodate the local traffic that uses it. We would be happy to have a condition that all construction vehicles must park off the road. This application has been a long and expensive process for the council. The council's legal advice from a planning barrister was that the judicial review could be defended because the application had been advertised in several ways and not just by the disputed site notice. The council had widely publicised the application, including writing to neighbours. The judicial review was brought because a second site notice was put up and the application was approved before the date for consultation comments expired. Our client has tried to work with the, the objection as many several times. The objector's property has only a small common boundary with the application site of a metre or so. The objector raised concerns about the common boundary, and we're happy to keep the trees and the hedge on that boundary, as well as on the northern and western boundaries. The site is very well enclosed by mature hedges, as is within a cluster of homes to the east and south. The neighbour has discussed with our client that they want to develop an eco-home on their property and wants our client to do the same. This application is in outline and sustainability measures would normally be put forward at the reserve matter stage. There are several planning conditions proposed in the committee report that include sustainability measures and we support these. This application and other developments nearby have been consistently supported by district and county councils or allowed at appeal. This proposal will cause minimal impact on the surrounding area because of the hedge screening, will meet a need for bungalows and is more sustainably located than much of the housing in the district. 
It will provide economic benefits to local builders, and I hope that you'll be able to support the application. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. For that. Okay, do we have okay, any do questions? Have any questions? Nope. Okay. Thank, okay. You. Thank you very much, Thank for, you joining much for joining us. us. Thank you. Okay, I'll now ask the ward members. Uh, we have two ward members, Councillor Mansell and Councillor. Who would like to go first? We're in your hands. I'd like to go first, Chair, if that's okay. Yep, of course. Right, thank you. Um, there are many grounds for refusing this application, but I'm going to concentrate on heritage. So that's the green and the listed building. And firstly, the green. I don't want to give you a lecture on the importance of Buttonhall Green, but I do have to point out a few things to show you how important it is. A green, as you all know, is an area of common land that dates back to medieval or even earlier times, used in the past by all common rights holders for grazing. Now, farmers tended to live around the edges of greens so that they had easy access to both their arable fields and the common grazing land. Commons and common edge settlement are very characteristic of Mid Suffolk, and that's in contrast to the nucleated villages you tend to find elsewhere. And that's because medieval Suffolk farmers tended to be free men. In other places, you get powerful lords who build planned villages of serfs where people could easily be controlled and made to work on the lord's farm. In Suffolk, medieval farmers were strongly individual and entrepreneurial. They, were, they would band together where necessary, but they normally worked alone. Now, Buttonhall Green, the green we're dealing with here, is one of the oldest and largest greens or commons in Suffolk. It was such a crucial communal resource that as many as four parishes claimed a share in it, and it is also one of the best preserved greens we have left, particularly here in its northern half. Now, because of the scale of development to the south, this area to the north of Elmswell, where all those four parishes meet, becomes even more valuable in heritage and landscape terms, and so shouldn't be lost. Now, the feeling of the open landscape may not be a material consideration, but the heritage value should be. Grove Farm and Half Acre, they provide what you might call a visible demarcation of the edge of the former green in this area. And this development will cause harm to this. It's the edge of the common that's the important thing. Now, the second heritage consideration is the impact on the nearby listed building. The heritage team did not comment on the impact on the setting of the Grade 2 listed Grove Farm, either for this application or for the previous application for the two bungalows fronting onto Grove Lane. Now, this is a serious omission. Grove, Grove Farm is a listed 16th century common edge farmhouse. Its setting is the common for which it forms the edge, and it is only just across the road. So the, this proposed development site forms a really important part of the understanding of the medieval and the early post-medieval setting of the farmhouse. So surely the harm resulting from this development should have been assessed. And I would think it would be sensible to ask the heritage team to give an opinion, given that Mid Suffolk's development control committees have a track record of refusing planning permission for developments which affect the setting of nearby common edge listed buildings. Now, examples just in the last year and just in my ward include those three houses near Dagwood Farm, also on the edge of Buttonhall Green, and a single house near Abbey Cottage on Woolpit Green. And that's perhaps the most similar, similar application to Hedgerows, um, because it was, again, right next to a group of two houses on the road that had very recently been granted planning permission. Now, both the Abbey Cottage and the Buttonhall, uh, sorry, the Abbey Cottage and the Dagwood Farm um, applications, in both cases, those, um, those refusals were upheld on appeal by a planning inspector. And the heritage response to the Dagwood Farm appeal is really excellent, and I would recommend to committee members that you have a look at it before you are, uh, vote in favour of allowing this application. The only reason I can imagine that no one's commented on the relationship between Grove Farm and this development is that there's an enormous Leylandii hedge around Grove Farm. It prevents the easy assessment of its setting as a common edge farm. This hedge is completely out of keeping of the surrounding landscape, but of course it's not permanent. If it were to be cut down, that link between Grove Farm and, its, and the common, and its common, would return. But if the common edge is built over, the link will be permanently broken. Now, lastly, there's the contention that all our policies are out of date, that's apparently supported by several appeal decisions. But it's a pity that the committee report has 
cherry picked only those appeal decisions which support its recommendation. There are plenty of other appeal decisions which tell a different story. And again, just one from my ward from this year is Lawn Farm at Woolpit, a very similar situation on the edge of a common, this time Woolpit Heath, a much less important common. Uh, the inspector said these policies are of some age and are to a degree inconsistent with the framework, the NPPF, and so are afforded reduced weight in my assessment. As reduced weight, not no weight, but that reduced weight given to those policies just 10 months ago, balanced with the heritage harms, meant that that appeal was dismissed. So houses were not built at Lawn Farm and houses should not be built here where the common is both more important and better preserved. So that's the end of my five minutes. If I could answer Councillor Matheson's question about the age of the um, of the grassland, um, if uh, Mr Sherwood is correct in thinking that it's been unploughed since 1954, it's very likely that it has, has never been ploughed, um, not since the Bronze Age. Um, the, the common was enclosed in 1814, so it may have been ploughed that year because there was a kind of arable maximum during the Napoleonic Wars. But ever since then, uh, everything we know about the agricultural history of Suffolk suggests that it's very unlikely. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for Councillor Geek? No? Uh, yes, Councillor Field. Yes, could I just ask about the, uh, the, the boundary to the common? Uh, you mentioned a very large Leandi hedge, which is, as you point out, temporary, but there is planning permission for two, two bungalows, I think, yeah, between the road farm and uh, uh, common is that we're talking uh, about. Aerial photograph help. So yeah, it yeah. Is, let's put up the aerial, let's put up the aerial photo. Impact. It we'll can't. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah if I could yeah. comment on that, that's um, that that is that is true. Uh, the application, uh, the committee report for that um, committee also didn't consider the impact on Grove Farm, which was, you know, very uh, easily arguable, uh, a, a big mistake. Um, but as I say, there are uh, there are um, comparable cases such as um, the land on Woolpit Green, Abbey Cottage and Woolpit Green, where um, the uh, the final, um, the, 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 the roadside uh, houses have been given permission, but the committee then uh, looked at that decision in, in the round and said, well, they, looking at the merits of this decision on its own, um, the, 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 perhaps it was a mistake. Um, okay, uh, what I'm going to do is... I if I, yeah, I don't I think, think those words are necessarily used, but you know, you yeah, have to. I think we've got to be quite careful. Here. You've made a, you've made quite a strong statement that 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 there was a huge. I've lost Hello. you. I think we need to be quite careful here. You've made quite a strong accusation, obviously, that there was a big error that the listed building wasn't taken into account in the previous application or on this one. Uh, that's quite a strong position to take and I think we need to hear from the officers around whether that has or has not happened. Okay, so it is the choice of the planning officers when they consult the heritage team and the heritage team actually also have a triage, triage uh, process when they don't wish to comment on applications. In this case, we have a listed building, which is this building uh, just here. Uh, it is a reasonable distance away and it has lots of uh, things in between. We've got a pond, we've got other outbuildings, and we have got various vegetation along the road on both this side of the road and on this side of the road before we get to the site at the back here. We also have the consideration that we have got two uh, bungalows essentially approved in front of it um, if they were to go forward. So no, the um, officer has not uh, consulted the heritage team on this particular case. Dagworth Farm um, has been mentioned in the report for the specific reason that that was mentioned by the representations received. Um, we didn't need to go further than that. We didn't think it was appropriate to try and look at every list of building on the entire common because uh, that'd be quite a few. Uh, ultimately, though, we did pick that one up because that one was re uh, refused by uh, the council on the basis of the common land and was also uh, refused by the heritage team. The reason for that is because all the buildings uh, associated with that were listed buildings. We don't have a listed building associated with the actual site in this case, uh, but we did in that case. 
and it was very carefully construed that obviously those listed buildings were set back uh, to the common land and the green in front of them the argument although unfortunately the impulse inspector did not agree with that argument because they did not agree that the common land was a non-designated uh, asset uh, in historic terms they did agree though in terms of the harm to the listed building and that was a different issue so okay. there is analysis that comes up. But you can see the relationship, and of course, yeah. of members need to make that judgment in their. I think that, that was going to be my point. That's members can now make the decision on whether they think uh, Councillor Geek or John Pateman G is presenting the appropriate uh, position. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Councillor Geek? Uh, Councillor Field, then Councillor Eburn. Sorry, Councillor Field just has his hand up still. <laughs> An old hand, I think we say. Uh, Councillor Eben. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Sorry, John. <laughs> Councillor Eben. Uh, thank you, Chair. But I, I was going to ask why there wasn't a heritage um, statement in the pack from the heritage officer, given that the curtilage of the listed building is directly opposite the site, because um, I found that odd, okay. but it, that's been answered. Thank that's you. been covered, yeah. Thanks. Any Anyone else wish to come in with any other questions? OK, thanks very much. Um, next, we move to Councillor Mansell. Over to you as the other ward member. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, right. Uh, firstly, I'd like to just remind everybody that the previous delegated decision to grant me um, needs to be disregarded since it was quashed by the Judicial Review. So I, I would urge you just to make your own minds up without prejudice. Um, Councillor Geek has uh, gone through uh, many heritage reasons for this application being refusable. Uh, we at Mid Suffolk do not currently have a local list of undesignated ancient greens, which has been mentioned by the heritage officers, but, but now green uh, will hopefully be listed as such in the emerging Elmswell neighbourhood plan. Um, I cannot support this application for two more bungalows in what I believe is an unsustainable location. Just because regrettably permission was granted for the two bungalows in front of this plot does not mean that it is suitable for a development of what will um, now be four new dwellings. Uh, placing the, these two dwellings behind the line of existing dwellings along that side of Grove Lane would also be contrary to the pattern of development uh, along this part of the lane. The officer report talks about walking distance to the amenities in the village. But this is extremely misleading. The map on page 23 of your report shows clearly the possible routes to the settlement boundary, not to the amenities, which are much further away. The ration, the co-op and the closest service bus stop are all about 1.8 kilometres away. The primary school, 2.2 kilometres and the Church of England church, 2.7 kilometres. The first 800 metres of all of these journeys is either along a road without a pavement or across rough footpaths, which will become very muddy in wet weather. I know about the footpaths, I run on them regularly um, uh, and, and do get extremely muddy and slippery. Grove Lane, which is the access for extra large HGVs of HG Wilson, is a single track road with passing places. It's heard that it has varying width. Uh, and the photograph which was shown as part of the uh, presentation is a Google street map picture which has got a very wide angle lens. So I don't think you can really judge the width of the lane. Uh, it is uh, probably in uh, between this plot and Ashfield Road, I would say it is wide enough for two cars to pass, but if there's a pedestrian in the way, they won't be able to pass and there's no verge. Two large vans to to go past one another and we do have the extra large um, HGVs as well. Ashfield Road itself is, is, is much busier than most C-class roads and it is used as a cut through for all types of vehicles from the A143 to the A14. Um, here we are proposing to build bungalows which even the applicant suggests might attract elderly people. They are probably less likely to want to walk for over half an hour to the shop and then carry their shopping back home again. They will use a car and if they subsequently become unable to drive, they will become isolated and rely heavily on their neighbours. Even so, it would be encouraging less reliance on the motor vehicle for everyone. 
In paragraph 3.7 of the report, the officer claims that this development offers strong and direct support to the vitality of the town. I'd like to point out that Elmswell is certainly not a town. And I think that two more bungalows will provide insignificant benefit to the vitality of Elmswell, given that we already have over 600 new dwellings already got permission uh, and the J draft JLP allocates over 800 dwellings. Elmswell is already a thriving community and it, if anything, its facilities are already growing to meet the demand. Two more dwellings is neither here nor there in the overall scheme of things. Whilst it is pleasing to see that the developer is proposing some rainwater harvesting, low carbon energy sources and some biodiversity um, mitigation, uh, the so-called benefits of this development certainly do not outweigh the disbenefits. These do not represent the right homes in the right places. So I would urge you to refuse this application on both heritage grounds and sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Mansell. Um, right, any... Uh, Questions you anyone wishes to pick up? Chairman, I'm, I'm sorry about make... the report. Yeah, do you just want to comment on the report as well, John? Yeah, my Is apologies. It... I've just I've just spotted it and I do apologise. You're quite right. Paragraph three point seven, page ten I've got here. Uh says viability. Page twenty six of... in our papers. Okay, sorry. Uh viability of the town. It should say village. I do apologise unreservedly for that uh, mistake. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we have no questions, so thank you, Councillor Mansell. Okay, so um, members, um, we now need to open up uh, for debate. Uh, I'm happy that we just go by hands up rather than going through it alphabetically, because I think uh, that sort of gives more people come forward when they want to speak rather than uh, having to speak. So, Councillor Eburn, you're first off, then Councillor Passmore. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Could I just ask John just to take the pick the, the screen down so that we, we just have members up now? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm um, very concerned about this um, development. I, I, I can't see at all how it could be classified as um, a sustainable development. It's well outside um, the village of Elmswell and it's in an area of open countryside along um, Grove Lane or walking or running whatever along Grove Lane on a Saturday when the HDVs aren't operating. You, you just you're absolutely in the middle of rural Suffolk. Um, so I'm I have really struggled with the fact that this is um, being classed as sustainable development. I, I do not think it is sustainable at all. Um, and I've um, been reading up on the NPPF and, um, you know, whether our policies hold for the sustainability. And the NPPF says um, it should avoid the development of isolated homes in the countryside unless a certain circumstance applies. And none of these apply in this um, particular instance. So, and I think the fact that we've got, if there's two homes already there um, approved, um, so firstly, I'd say it's uns completely unsustainable. Secondly, I think it's a f overdevelopment of the site. You've got um, along Grove Lane, there are only homes actually along Grove Lane. There aren't any kind of back from the lane um, in in houses behind other houses as it were um, so and that's the, the case all the way along um, there's the there's just the odd farmhouse the odd house here and there as you go down Grove Lane so uh, secondly I'd say it's overdevelopment of the site and thirdly um, I'm disappointed I appreciate um, the planning officers comments about how they pull a report together but I'm very disappointed that there's no heritage response and I think that um, it, or even on heritage grounds. I mean, we have we sit through other planning applications where listed buildings are 500 metres away, and we're told to consider them within this application. Here, we've got one that's that's opposite the curtilage of it is opposite the the site. Um, so I don't understand why we don't give that um, you know decent weight, and why there isn't heritage response. So. Um, I, I'm definitely not sitting on the fence on this one, Chair. I've got. I would say absolutely. I would be. Um, 
voting in favour of refusal on basis of unsustainability, overdevelopment of the site and heritage grounds. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Councillor uh, thanks very much, Matthew. Uh, I've listened extremely carefully to all the arguments from all sides, and this is a difficult um, issue to make a decision on. However, having listened to that, I, f I am on balance uh, going to support the application and what the officers say for the following reasons. We are only talking about two additional homes, and it does provide a benefit to the local economy, of course, from building. And I think the conditions, and we're only talking about outline planning permission here, of course, um, and of course the conditions put down there recommended by the officers, I do think provide sufficient mitigation, looking at biodiversity, carbon footprints, and as I was always say, how do we better use scarce natural resources? And therefore, I think on balance, um, I would like to propose uh, approval of this. Other things I would like to comment on this, um, I, I, I do understand the issue about um, access and transport and so on. And I would, if it's possible, like to make sure that the access to the site, if it's granted, is properly landscaped. And I don't just mean a few um, little stumps of uh, hedges and so on, a proper mixed um, hedge uh, like we have all over farmland in Suffolk that I know particularly well. Very important we do that. And making sure that the design details under the reserve matters are extremely sympathetic um, to the neighbouring properties and so on, because that is absolutely crucial. We do need more bungalows in uh, mid Suffolk. And it's also the point that I think we've got to be very careful if we're suggesting that older people um, perhaps you question whether they should live there. You know, we do believe in freedom of choice here, and there are plenty of old people who are even older than I am. Um, who are actually quite capable of driving cars and so on. And with electrification of vehicles, I think that argument is perhaps not one that I, I, I would support, that, um, because we do need bungalows uh, in, in Mid Suffolk. As regards the setting of a listed building, this I remember coming up when I was on the planning committee before. It is a debatable point. I do understand the assertion made by some of the um, committee members. But again, on balance, the listed building we're talking about is some considerable distance away from this application. And the fact that these uh, two bungalows would go behind those uh, buildings that have already been given permission, I think sufficiently mitigates um, that for my, um, from my point of view. So the reasons for uh, um, go with the officer's, officer's recommendation, I think we do have to look very sensibly at the implications of the national um, planning framework, policy planning framework. Is a difficult decision. I quite understand everybody else's point of view, but as I say, Chairman, in my view, I would like to propose approval of this, um, and it is a difficult uh, debate to have. So there you have it. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, Councillor Muller. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to second um, Councillor Passmore's um, recommendation for approval of this application. Uh, we've we've had several mentions about appeal decisions, etc. But the position of MSDC policies being out of date has been settled by a number of recent appeal decisions within Mid Suffolk and the relevant appeal decisions are material considerations. We should also consider that the new Anglia strategic economic plan does acknowledge that house building is a powerful stimulus for growth and supports around 1.5 jobs directly and up to other additional jobs in the wider community. I do, I do believe also that there is a shortage of bungalows. Uh, therefore, I think this is a good proposal. I do not think it will have much effect on the actual listed building of Grove Farm. Uh, and therefore, I'm happy to second uh, Councillor Passmore's proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else wish to come in? Councillor Matheson. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm, I've grown increasingly uh, unhappy with this application as, as we've heard more about it. And I think for four reasons, really, altogether. Um, the bungalow argument, um, yes, it would be it would be great to see some, but I mean, more bungalows in Elms. Well, I seem to recall them fighting to get a handful on a big development right in the middle of the village where they where they would have been most beneficial. This is not helpful. In, they're in the wrong place here. Um, I don't think we should follow the poor precedent of the first two 
um, they, they're not a good precedent to follow at all. Um, I've been uh, quite concerned to, to hear more about the heritage argument, um, particularly that the, the, um, the, the, the the curtilage of the grow farms actually right opposite the entrance to this uh, this development proposal. Um, thirdly, this is something that used to be called backland development, um, a, a phrase we haven't heard so much of recently. But it is what it is what it is, and um, it isn't characteristic of um, of Grove Lane, which uh, so I, I know very well, having lived so close, and. Um, but by the way, for, on the traffic front, I could just just mention the the old phrase um, about the, the Mr. Wilson's big lorries. Um, what we're talking about is abnormal loads. They are enormous. <laughs> they are very long, <laughs> and um, they they do take up the whole the whole lane when they are moving. So just so everyone understands what that's about. But I think the most important thing ultimately is that we should be looking for biodiversity net gain and to to lose a piece of pasture which which has been probably unimproved and never ploughed um, that is a very big biodiversity loss and i can't see any significant gain that um that's here that could could outweigh that so i really cannot support approval. Thank you very much. Councillor Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Um, for me, this is, is quite finely balanced. Um, there are benefits uh, and there are impacts. Um, but without going over the points raised by um, previous councillors, uh, to my mind, the benefits do not significantly and demonstrably outperform the impacts. So therefore, I think even though it's a fine balance, um, we should find in favour of this development. Um, a point that um, Councillor Eburn raised about overdevelopment, I can't support that. If you look at um, the lane, there are small groups of um, buildings, houses all the way down that lane. And indeed, with the bungalows, if they were built, it would balance quite nicely with the um, the heritage site, the other side of the road, where you've got a small group of buildings. It's not individual buildings down the road. So on balance, even though I believe that the, the benefits and the impacts are quite evenly balanced, um, there isn't that significant um, outweighing. So I, I will be supporting um, this application. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Field. As people keep saying it's quite balanced. One feels one needs to make a decision. Or do I just kick this down the road to the uh, planning inspectorate yet again? Um, and as I say, if one sums these things up, it tends to, to if, if we're not careful, just saying the same things again. And the, the heritage argument exists. Uh, and I, I was quite persuaded by the talk about the uh, ancient green, although it's not uh, an undesignated heritage asset, as I understand it at the moment. So perhaps we're exaggerating its status somewhat. Uh, the farm is a substantial distance away. Uh, whether it's the right sort of thinking or not, I, as I sit here, uh, my village has a number of heritage of um, listed buildings in it. Um, there would be nothing else if we kept a large distance around every one of them. Um, so there are issues there. Uh, should we be adopting an attitude that says um, we may only build on roads where there is a pavement? There are many villages in Suffolk without pavements. Should it just be that older people like my good self should be banned from such villages because of the incredible danger we will experience if we walk along the village street? And there is a danger without a shadow of doubt. Um, so I don't find these things easy to to, to sum up, really. Uh, is this an isolated house? Uh, as someone said, if you look at MPPF, it clearly says that isolated houses in the countryside are not 
to be built, but that in principle, you it is acceptable and in fact encouraged to build to an extent in the countryside. And I, when I looked at the maps of this, I have a job to believe that this location is isolated. There are dwellings both sides of it. Um, as we said, there are two bungalows intended in front of the site. Um, there are a number of other uh, dwellings pretty close along uh, along the lane and certainly on the road into Elmswell. Um, should we really be proposing that everything is totally unsustainable? I do, I, I do to an extent, go along with the comment that uh, Councillor Passmore made about the thought that uh, although petrol and diesel cars are clearly not acceptable uh, as we as we move uh, forward into a, a carbon-free world, it may well be that electric vehicles uh, are um, so difficult. I shall decide as I put my hand up, no doubt, or not, as it may be. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Councillor Field. So everyone has spoken who wants to speak. Does anyone else wish to come in? No? OK, so I'm going to go over to the Chief Planning Officer to remind uh, the proposal of what's before us. Then I'll ask the Governance Officer to, to conduct a roll call, uh, with the proposer being Councillor Passmore and the seconder, Councillor Muller, for approval of the recommendations laid out in our papers on page 34 and page 35. Is that correct, John? So, um, yes, um, so the recommendation here is for outline planning permission for two uh, single storey properties with access uh, included. And the recommendation is one for uh, approval uh, subject to conditions as outlined by your papers. Um, that's probably all I need to say. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Field, did you want to come back in? And Councillor Matheson, I have your hands up. No, I'm on the old hand problem again. Okay. No problem. Uh, Councillor Matheson? Yeah, can we just talk about the uh, conditions for a moment before we rush to, to a decision? Um, the the Swifts, I think bricks are, are preferable to boxes because they, they will be permanent. And um, the, uh, the in terms of the level access and so on, I think what we're talking about is called an accessible standard um, rather than a, a lower standard. So if we could use the, the correct phrasing there. And also, I didn't really understand the energy, being, energy and renewal integration. I think there's probably at least a typo there, and perhaps we could um, be clear what we're... Um, okay. We'll just ask John Petrie to come in and clarify. Um, in terms of the Swift Owland, probably the word bat should be there as well, actually. Bat boxes, I'm happy to change that to scheme uh, in the general sense, uh, because ultimately reserve matters isn't before us, and uh, we, we we can push that down the road in terms of that condition. So I'll, I'll change boxes to uh, owl, swift and bat uh, scheme to be agreed. Uh, respect of energy and renewable um, then obviously you know this allows us to seek you know renewable energy elements such as solar panels air source heat pumps and so forth um, to come forward for us to agree um, I'm I missed the third was there a third point there as well there the points yes the now. the um the, there is there are three standards of accessibility for dwellings um, and um, the, so put the level best, access, the, the level appropriate access, one, drum. accessible access, uh, accessible standard, I think it's called. OK, well, uh, we'll as a council, we've never we've. As a council, we've never applied any access standards whatsoever, and I have started to introduce the idea of at least having level access uh, available from the outside into the property. So this is a relatively new thing that we are starting to try and push forward as a a, a commitment for developers to comply with. I personally, you know, I've I've had design tours where we've gone around modern housing estates, especially where even though it's very flat land, there's still two steps up to the front door. Uh, totally unacceptable, really, and with no reason to have that so we are now trying to make sure there at least level access to enable wheelchair access for all dwellings that's what that condition is about thank you yeah. thank you yeah I'm, i was just trying to to um point to a specific standard that is available and which yeah. i think we're John, going I'll... to incorporate in future yep. in jlp 
Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Field. Yes, point I forgot from my earlier discussion. Uh, really, um, I think one of the protesters did point out that this would be more acceptable if it met a very high environmental standard. And we seem to have a number of conditions which might allow us to apply higher standards. Uh, I, I would certainly be happier, as John Matheson actually just said, that if we were ensuring there were substantially higher standards approaching the pass passive house type of level, uh, we'd be reluctant to propose a particular um, possibly costly approval process, but, but certainly we need um, uh, to move in that direction and get very close to it. If well, we're can I, what I'll do, John, is uh, that will be up to the proposer and seconder. But let me just hear from Ian de Prez and then um, yes, John Payton G, because both have their hands up. Very, just very briefly, Chairman, I, I could have waited a couple of minutes possibly, but I'll, um, for the, I mean, we, everyone in the meeting knows this, I think, but for the benefit of anyone watching this on, on YouTube live stream, to confirm the this council's usual process is that Mid, Mid Suffolk District Council has a rule that the ward, ward members may speak but not vote. This is an eight member committee. Councillor Sarah Mansell is a member of the committee, but she, I think if we were in the council chamber, she'd be sitting on the opposite side of the oh, chamber. Yes, I will, we will go through that when we come yeah. to roll call the vote. You, that, that's just to make sure that's understood. That's all I needed. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, John Payman G. Is there anything further you wish to add about the conditions? Um, in respect of the conditions, I don't think there's anything much further I could add, but if you are moving into changing the proposal to say this is a passive house, which is a, a far higher, a uh, different design spec, um, I'm, that is not before us. Um, yeah. And okay. I, I would, you know, that, that's what I would Thank totally you. say there. Okay, uh, so uh, Tim Passmore uh, and Dave Muller, Councillor Muller and Passmore, obviously, We've made a few changes there to the recommendation that have been suggested uh, regarding SWIFT our BAP schemes to be agreed. We're leaving the level access because that's been explained to us what that's around. Um, is there anything else you want to change in the conditions before we go to a vote? Are you happy as they stand? Um, thanks, Matthew. Well, yeah, I am happy with that as they stand, but I do take um, John Field's point. It is about, as I said earlier, about um, trying to make the best use of scarce natural resource. I wouldn't go so far as to a, an absolute eco house, but I hope that the officers, whilst we can't necessarily condition it to every single word, do take full account of making best use of scarce natural resources, which includes reduction of uh, carbon footprint, uh, grey water schemes, harvesting rain, etc. So. The spirit of it is, I know you can't condition it specifically, I'm well aware of that, but I absolutely agree with what John, John said there. So as long as the officers take that into account, I'm happy to leave it as it is. Okay, and the same, uh, same with you? Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm yeah. happy to leave it as okay. it is. Thank you, Chair. So on that basis, we'll now go to a vote. Can I ask the governance officer to conduct the roll call, please? Thank you, Chair. So... Um, just as Mr. Dupre was, has laid out um, in the in his previous point earlier, um, Councillor Mansell, um, as the ward member, cannot vote on the application. So, if I if you could please respond with for, against, or abstain. So, Councillor Rachel Eburn. Against. Oh no, my pen has decided to give up the ghost. <laughs> <laughs> it would. That's apologies, Chair. Right. Um, Technology. So we have, we have uh, Mr. Duprez, who's with us and can keep a record as well. Okay. Yes, Chairman. I'll, I'm counting as well, so don't worry. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> Councillor Field. Oh, sorry, Councillor Eber. Uh, did I? Could I just confirm again? Sorry, just yeah. so. Against. I said thank you. Thank you. Sorry, oh. Councillor. Um, Councillor Field. Four. Councillor Hicks. Four. Councillor Matheson. Against. Councillor Mayer. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. And Councillor Passmore. Four. Thank you, Chair. I make that five votes to two. And carried. And 
Yes, Chair, I agree. Five votes to five, five votes to two carried. OK, thank you very much, everyone. So the next item uh, is the land staff of south of Fox Hollow, the street Wyverston. What I pr propose is we always say we should have a break every 90 minutes. So we'll start again at 10 minutes past 11, please. So we have a 10 minute.
Thanks, everyone, and welcome back uh, to the second uh, part of the Mid Suffolk District Council uh, Development Control Committee A meeting. Uh, just to make sure that everyone has returned, uh, could I ask if we could just do a roll call to, with the governance officer? Just check everyone is now present. Thank you, Chair. So, just get the list up here. So we have. So if we could just let me know if you're back. Is Councillor Eburn present? Councillor Field. Present. Councillor Hicks. Present. Councillor Mansell. Present. Councillor Matheson. Present. Councillor Mayer. Present. Councillor Muller. Present. Councillor Passmore. Present. And Councillor Mellon, who is attending as the ward member. Present. Thank you, Chair. We're all here. Lovely, thanks. Great, thank you very much. So we now move on to DC 2003244, land south of Fox Hollow, the street Wyverston. Uh, and I hand over to the case officer, Alex Scott, to introduce the application, please. Sorry, Matthew, before you move on, Rick speaking, yes. uh, Councillor Mayor, I've just noted during the break that John Stebbing is the architect for this uh, development. Um, I, I'd like to declare that I know John Stebbing, he lives in my ward. OK, thank you. So that's a non-pecuniary interest. Um, yes, Chairman, that's a that's a non-pecuniary interest, um, du duly noted as such. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Alex Scott, to introduce. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, if I can just try and share my screen and put the presentation up. That's the correct one, and we'll go to the slideshow so everybody can see that. Here we are, right. Okay, um, right, so this is uh, application reference DC oblique 20, oblique 03244, uh, land south of Fox Hollow, the street in Wyverstone. The application is submitted under Section 73 of the Town and Country Planning Act uh, to vary the approved plans and documents of an existing planning permission, reference DC oblique 20 oblique 02022, which was uh, granted uh, for the erection of one single storey dwelling and detached garage and construction of a new vehicular access. This was granted under delegated authority, authority delegated to uh, the chief planning officer in July of this year. So um, this application is to, to vary that existing, that existing permission. The proposed amendments propose to move the approved dwelling further back into the site by approximately 14 meters, to move the location of the garage back by approximately 15.6 meters, to extend the garage by approximately one metre in width and with some minor external window and door alterations to the east elevation of the garage. The application does not propose any alterations to the approved scale and design of the dwelling, just its location, and the approved access um, is also not proposed to be altered by way of this uh, current Section 73 application. Now, the application has been uh, reported to Development uh, Committee by the ward member and uh, for the reasons as set out in your in your papers. So we'll move to the, to the presentation itself. And for the avoidance of doubt, um, this is the location of Wyverstone within the district. Um, this is the general location of the site within the immediate area at uh, Wyverstone Street. This is the site location plan as submitted with the application proposal. Now, the site, which is edged in red here, extends to 0.274 of a hectare. It sits to the rear of uh, the properties of Fox Hollow and Field Haven to the north. And this slide shows you the uh, planning constraints which affect the site and area. And the green lines indicate the settlement boundaries as defined in the current local plan. The coloured buildings 
as you can see here in, in orange, uh, some in red, are listed buildings. The avenue of trees to the uh, to the lane and in front of the site is uh, protected by a tree preservation order. And this blue area off to the east of a site um, represents the Environment Agency flood zones, flood zones two and three. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is a, an aerial view of the of the wider area. And we have a, uh, a more close up uh, aerial view of the of the site, which again is edged in red here. Um, points of reference. Uh, this uh, existing building to the south is, a, is an agricultural shed, um, also within the, the applicant's ownership. And this uh, existing bund in the centre with, with trees is uh, um, proposed to be removed and has been approved to be removed by way of the uh, existing permission, which uh, the applicant is uh, proposing to, to alter by way of this Section 73 application. This is a site layout as proposed, and in for comparison for you uh, on the left of your screen, um, this is the layout as already approved by the host planning permit, and on the right is what is currently proposed. So the proposed dwelling is moved back in the site um, by a further 14 metres, and um, it is a, a little bit closer to the uh, neighbouring boundary by about 0.2 of a metre. That's that's 20 centimetres. And the garage um, again is proposed to be moved back um, by 15.6 metres. And um, it, it would uh, line up with the, the front of the existing shed to the south and uh, adjacent to this uh, building in the on the neighbour's property. Um, presumed to be an outbuilding, but um, uh, perhaps um, the, the neighbour or the um, uh, the objector could uh, confirm that because um, not having the opportunity to go onto the neighbour's property, it wasn't that clear from my site visit, I must say. So uh, perhaps they could uh, clarify that. Thank you. Um, and yes, the uh, the the outbuilding would be uh, 0.7 of a metre closer to the to the boundary. Um, that's uh, 70 centimetres and the proposed access is uh, staying as is and there are some uh, some alterations to the uh, to the driveway and uh, parking arrangements um, as you can see there as well uh, this is the proposed plans of the dwelling and uh, as i mentioned before these are not proposed to change under the current application uh, just where it would be on the site uh, as you can see, this is a uh, four bedroom bungalow and for reference, the uh, maximum ridge height would be six metres. This is the garage as uh, currently proposed. And then for uh, comparison again, uh, on the left is what uh, has already been uh, approved by where the host application and on the right is what uh, has been it is, is currently uh, proposed. Uh, the proposed building um, would be one meter wider as currently proposed and it is proposed to put a, a gym um, for domestic use uh, within the uh, within the building and a ancillary shower room uh, in lieu of the, the stores, which were uh, previously approved. And there are some uh, minor alterations to the uh, doors and windows to the east elevation, which um, looks away from the highway into the uh, into the site. And this is the uh, proposed access to the site. Uh, the existing access will be uh, stopped up. And uh, this has already been uh, approved by way of the host uh, planning permission and is not proposed to be uh, altered at all by way of the, uh, the current application. On to some photographs for you. This is the uh, existing uh, site access. Uh, this just shows the uh, relationship with the uh, existing dwellings. Um, so we're at the bottom of the, the rear gardens of the existing properties. 
and uh, this is taken um, from the access looking into the site and for reference the proposed garage would be in approximately this location uh, with the proposed dwelling sitting behind this bunding but uh, that bunding as mentioned before will uh, will be removed and uh, has been approved to be removed by way of the uh, previous application. And this is the existing agricultural shed um, to the south of the proposal site, but uh, within the applicant's ownership as shown within the blue line on the site location plan. And finally, we have a uh, view of the street scene um, back up from the site frontage towards the uh, street. And this is uh, the adjacent dwelling at Fox Hollow, um, just off to the right here. And that concludes the presentation. Uh, officer's recommendation, as set out in the papers, is for approval. Thank you. Thank you. Can you just go back to the uh, put up oh, a picture sorry. of the two proposals, the the before and after? Because I think it, we just have a have that up. That might be useful. Indeed. Councillor Matheson, you wanted to come in. Yeah. What was the purpose of the bunding? Did that have some particular landscaping? function um, in terms of screening something else that's being lost? Um, I'm not aware of why that was uh, originally planted, uh, Councillor Matheson. Um, yes, that, that's not clear. That's, we that, can that's ask the, we can maybe Let ask. unfold later. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But are you saying it's got permission to go from the first application? Uh, yes, as you can see, the uh, approved layout already here on the uh, the left of we're your not, screen. We're not seeing your oh, right, that, up yet. So it's removed anyway. OK, well, yeah. we'll stop worrying about that one then. OK. Uh, Alex, could you put up that picture before and after? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, are you not uh, getting that? It's showing on no. my screen. Um, I'll try and uh, see what's going on with the okay. technology. OK, we'll keep going. Uh, Councillor yeah. Mansell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I've got a number of questions and I'm not sure if they're all actually relevant. So do tell me if I'm not meant to be asking such questions. Um, first, of, my first question is about the band of uh, protected trees. Uh, now, whilst I understand the access has already got permission, do any of those trees have to come down for the access? That's my first question. Uh, second question is um, there's a power line across the site. Um, and I'm not sure where that is in relation to where the new dwelling is going to go and whether it's in the way or whether the wires are in the way. Um, so can you explain that? And my third question was about the consultation from place services, which is on pages 73 to 75 of our papers, where there are a number of um, conditions or strategies that have been proposed and they don't appear in the permission that's already been granted for the for the house has already got permission and I wondered if they were likely to or why they weren't in that permission and can we put them into this one if necessary okay thanks very much I think they're all questions absolutely so over to you uh, Alex please <laughs> okay um, now the the first question which I believe was um, the um, any further protected, trees protected to be taken? Trees. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, well, the the answer to that is uh, no. Nothing further than uh, what has already been uh, approved. And um, your uh, your tree officer, your arbor arboricultural officer. I'll just get that right. Um, um, has been um, consulted. Uh, has raised no objection. Subject to condition, um, which was imposed on the host and um, is uh, proposed to be repeated um, by way of this um, section 73 application. Um, the existing access is proposed to be replanted. So uh, what we what we lose, we we gain in this location um, uh, over here. Um, in terms the of power the line. power lines, yes, yeah. I was just trying to pick that up on. Uh, one of the photographs I uh, I had, yeah, I believe there's um, the start of it here, and it would uh, go along the um, the site. Um, yeah, when, when I was on site, I didn't believe it was uh, directly um, above the proposed garage building. It would be uh, quite close, but um, uh, not directly above it. Um, therefore, I didn't think there was any particular conflict. Um, although that would be a um, 
a discussion with the utilities companies about the uh, the distance away um, a building had to be to to power lines. I'm not I'm not aware of that, but okay. um, uh, for planning, um, I, I think there's a significant uh, impact there. And um, point from place services. Point from place services. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, now that this is a section 73 application um, to um, vary condition two only. Um, uh, could, may, may I just uh, ask the, the the chief officer um, as you on um, adding additional conditions which haven't already been um, imposed by where the host application because that wasn't picked up at uh, the host application. Uh, John are you able to? Yeah I, I, I was <laughs> You're getting in, okay. I was trying to. I thought this might come up, and I'm trying to think of a easy way to summarise this. So, what we've got before is it's called a section 73, but it, it's an old-fashioned term for effectively saying this is a minor amendment application. So we have the main application already granted, the principal, the layout, everything else, all pa packaged up already. This is seeking to only change one element of that, and the element it's trying to change is the approved plans. Now, if we, uh, uh, if the change in the plans means that we can associate a, a further condition to that specific change, then we can probably get away with adding further conditions. But in this case, what we're dealing with is a movement of the building back and the movement of the garage back. I would find it difficult to see how I would then associate the principle of the development in terms of the biodiversity net gain to the fact that the building has just moved back and I think that would be unreasonable to impose a further condition in that context. Now if I had to, because of the movement of the building back and I had to impose a further condition in respect of a particular window because by moving the building back the window would start to overlook or have a different effect on amenity and we could solve that by putting a further condition on then yes, that would be reasonable and, and probably a lawful approach to, to this uh, particular way forward. But uh, when you start getting to other grounds, such as, uh, you know, why was not renewable energies imposed on this site before? Why was there? You, you, you've got to ask yourself, how can I justify that against what this proposal actually is? Um, and um, that would be difficult. It is not impossible to do it. But it is not recommended and it is a subject possibly that you get done for costs for appeal if it is deemed to be unreasonable behaviour. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think you, you, yeah. could, could I just, back. Uh, well, I, firstly, um, I'd like to thank um, the explanation about the conditions, um, but I'd just like to come back on the power cable. Uh, because as I said uh, earlier on, I did go and have a look at the site and I uh, the photo that um, is on our presentation is is not quite such a wide angle as the one I took myself. And there is another, the, the wires go to another pole further back on the side. And I, I, it's very hard to judge the depth of the field, but it looks to me like the house is going to be under the power lines. Let's, can I suggest we raise, wrong, that with but, let's raise that with the applicant? OK, thank you. Yeah. Councillor Passmore. Thanks, Matthew. Just to, really following on from um, John Paper G's comments, and I don't know whether it's uh, he or Alex would like to answer. Could you just remind me? I know we're moving the proposal to move the site um, backwards. How far away would it be from uh, the neighbouring properties in the in, for the now? And then, if we have, agree the uh, amendment, how far away would it be? I know we're moving it back. Uh, what is it? The um, certain number of me, 14 metres. But how does that affect the distance to the neighbouring property and the uh, comment about visual amenity effects on that potential effects on that, please? Um, well, I'll, I'll ask answer that if I may. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yes, uh, it would be the, the current proposal would be 36 metres as I measure it uh, from the rear of the uh, nearest existing uh, neighbouring property, which is uh, Field Haven. Okay. Uh, Fair right, right. And that would be um, uh, 0.2 of a metre, which is 20 centimetres clo closer than. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, OK. Yeah. And on the visual amenity, have you got a, could you just comment what your assessment of that would be? Does it affect it or, or not really? Well, um, yes, I said in my report, um, yeah. I, I, did, I didn't think so as um, case officer. That's my assessment. It's a single storey dwelling. Um, you, you have a distance to the existing boundary and then a significant distance to the um, 
um, to the dwelling as well. Um, yes, it may impinge on a, a view slightly, but uh, no significant impact on existing residential amenity um, was my assessment. That's helpful. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we may not have the applicant speaking, I'm I'm informed, but we'll get to that. Uh, Councillor Mount, so we'll come back to you on that. We'll just see, see where we are. And if you need to raise it further uh, before we go into debate, we can do that, if that's OK. Uh, Councillor Field. Thank you. Um, we've just heard how far the dwelling would be from uh, adjacent properties. I, I note it uh, seems to be being moved because of the distance from it to the um, shed which or barn that the uh, applicant owns. I wonder what that is as a comparable distance. Presumably that's being done for amenity reasons. Um, and uh, are we arguing that that amenity is one that needs to be um, improved and the one of the existing neighbours is one that isn't significantly impacted? So what's um, the distance? Uh, yep. Yeah. What is it? What is the distance between the um, right? Well, I've got a scale bar there. So, yeah. So I make it approximately twenty meters between the existing barn and the proposed dwelling. So, so, so a bit under two to one difference. Okay. Okay, uh, Councillor Mansell, is that an old hand? I've taken it away now. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, we don't have any other questions at this point, uh, so we'll now move on. Um, I'd now like, we don't have anyone from the parish council to speak today that's joined us, but we do have an objector, Mr. Glenn Horn. Mr. Glenn Horn, if you'd like to turn on your camera and your microphone, please, and you have three minutes to address the committee. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, can I just make it clear I'm speaking on behalf of Mr. and Mrs. Bentley, who are the residents of Field Haven, um, and Councillor Field has just summed it up exactly right. The proposal moves the new building from behind Fox Hollow to behind Field Haven and their house, uh, and the concern is that a six metre high, even if it is a bungalow building, does have a significant impact on their amenity. Uh, the justification for the move is to improve the view for the new residents uh, of this property. Um, there is a principle in planning that no one is entitled to a view. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bentley fully appreciate this, uh, although this being the case, how could it be that residents of a new building should have a greater entitlement than existing residents? Uh, the proposed new location does have a negative impact uh, on the nearest neighbours because it does impact on their outlook and potentially the privacy, certainly in their garden, uh, which are material considerations, uh, as this proposed site is now directly aligned with the rear of their property. Uh, we're simply asking the uh, principle to be applied evenly. Miss Suffolk planning policy seeks not to cause harm to existing communities or residents, so on balance, the consideration must be tilted in favour of the current residents rather than towards a new bill. Uh, another consideration is that by moving this building across even further, it could have been placed directly behind the applicant's existing residential property, the Laurels. Uh, we've not seen any justification as to why this hasn't been proposed, because that would probably be more suitable. Uh, unfortunately, the reasonable assumption is that by going here, it would negatively impact on the Laurels in very much the same way and would therefore be undesirable. It would also potentially reduce the number of available plots across the rest of the site, uh, lending weight to our concerns regarding the potential for future development. So quite simply, the original location is at the entrance to the site and as such would restrict access to the rest of the site and therefore in itself reduce potential for further development. It's also shielded from view, view by the existing outbuilding at the end of the garden of Fox Hollow. Unfortunately, the removal of condition two, allowing this building to be been to the proposed new location, could clearly lead to the own development of the whole site. And the original granted permission identifies the potential overdevelopment of the site as a risk and has two conditions specifically in place to address this risk. Uh, conditions 14 and 15 
are in place in order to avoid cumulative developments that will be detrimental to amenity and contrary to RC. Uh, the summary is that we are asked the committee to consider how they would view an application which had the potential to deliver uncontrolled significant growth if it were brought forward in their own wards, to ensure the principle of entitlement to a view be evenly applied, uh, and to ensure that the existing conditions which are in place simply being maintained and fully enforced. They are a balanced and rational approach which effectively address uh, the, the uh, residents' concerns uh, and there's been no good case made for the conditions to be removed or altered. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay, um, do we have any questions? Chairman, may I pick up a couple yes. of points if I may, just Please before do. questions. Yeah. Um, just in respect of the mention of conditions 14 and 15, um, this is a variation of only one condition, which is condition two. All other conditions within the host application would be remain in effect. Uh, this is also not the removal of condition two, that is the variation of it by obviously changing the approved plans. Um, and I just want to be clear on, on, on that. Um, the other thing I would say is that the host uh, application, if you like, has a Pacific red plan. Uh, the land behind the laurels, I think it was, is outside of that red line plan. So this application can't be varied to go beyond the red line that's already been approved. That would be a different application. That would be a fresh application in its entirety. Thank yeah. you. So we can only look at what's before us today. Thank you. OK, um, do we have any questions? Uh, Councillor Muller. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Horn, could you could you just clarify what the building is on the Fox Hollow site directly behind the proposed site of the garage? Uh, it's, a, it's a garden out building. It's a, site. It's a garden out building. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Mayor. Um, Mr Horn, can you confirm Field Haven? That is a bungalow, is it? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. OK, any other questions? No? OK, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we now move on. Uh, we don't have a supporter, so I'll now ask the applicant to speak uh, if they've joined us. Uh, Robert, uh, has the applicant joined us today? Sorry, Chair, thank you for um, that. The um, applicant didn't ask to speak at the committee today. Um, it was in okay. your order of proceedings, but in anticipation, but they I have not heard anything from the applicant. OK, thank you. So we now go straight on to the ward member then, Councillor Andrew Mellon, uh, to address the committee. Councillor Mellon, over to you. Uh, good morning, Chair, and good morning, committee members. Uh, members will have seen that uh, this application is before you this morning because of a call-in that I instigated. Uh, and I should state that Wivesden is my home village, um, although I live at the other end of the village to the application site. Um, I think it's useful for councillors to know that there is a, a, a longer planning history than has appeared in the papers um, uh, in, in terms of the wider area um, that the applicant owns. The first application that came in was uh, DC 1802122, applying for a change of use of an agricultural building to a dwelling house. This is the metal clad barn which you saw in the presentation. Uh, this application, application was refused. Uh, it was taken to appeal and was also turned down on appeal. We then had the outline application for one detached dwelling, DC 19-03846, which has appeared, which was approved in October 2019. And this was then followed by full application DC 20-02022, which you have in the bundle of papers. And that was approved only in July this year. And now we have the application before us, which I have called in. Uh, now, I realise that this may seem to members that the current application is a minor change to that already, already granted. The bungalow is shunted back in the site and the garage is made larger. However, as I have set out, this application is part of a series of applications in the area. And I believe this one has the greatest impact on the residential amenity of neighbouring properties. On page 90 of the papers, the, the second paragraph sets out our policy that development should not materially or detrimentally affect the amenities of the occupiers of neighbouring properties. Um, this is in the officer's report for the existing permission for the front of the site, which then goes on to state that there were no concerns with that application. 
But I would like to argue that with this application, the proposed bungalow will cause detriment to the residents of Fieldhaven, as it is now nearer to them, uh, really at the end of their garden. And they have hitherto enjoyed a rural outlook from their house and garden, and this would be largely lost. They would not be losing just a view, it'd be much more than that. The application site sits at a slightly higher elevation than the garden of Fieldhaven, so there's concern about overlooking. My other concern is that pushing the development back in the site opens up essentially a new sector of development into agricultural land bordering the village. We have an existing permission close to the road frontage and this is accepted. If built out as agreed, only back in July, it would form part of a, a, an intermittent line of development down the lane, which is known locally as Ketcher's Lane. So this development includes the existing metal barn, which I referred to earlier, as well as other buildings and homes a few hundred yards further down the lane. But what we're considering today pushes development back into the agricultural hinterland behind this line of development. As I see it, although a minor change, it would be a significant and worrying extension to the settlement envelope. Now, I'm not opposed to development in the village. Wyveston has had several permissions granted, including one for two homes uh, this granted this week, which I supported. But we have an existing permission, which everyone is happy with, granted only three months ago, and bearing in mind the pattern of applications, this new one is a step too far. The applicant states that the reason for the proposed amendment is to improve their view, but this can only happen by, by causing a significant detriment to others. So can I urge committee members to reject this application, leaving the applicant to build out his existing permission, which is agreed by all to be a better result? Thank you. Thanks very much, Councilman. Um, OK, do we have any questions for the ward member? No, nope, we have no hands up. OK, thank you very much. Um, OK, so it's now up to us uh, to discuss. Oh, Councilor Melling, I tell you, you might be able to answer one question about the power lines uh, as the applicant isn't here. Can you give any insight into the, where the power lines are on the site? Uh, I'm afraid I can't, Chair. Sorry, I have no information on that. No problem. Thanks very much. Chair, I, I, may be able, I may be able to help if you would yep. like me to. Yep, I, I appreciate this is Google Street View, um, and I don't know how old specifically this uh, is, but if I just quickly share this, it shows the power line. I think that's what we're talking about. Uh, bear with me. OK, thank you. You hit a button and nothing happens. That's always good, isn't it? Try again. Here we go. <laughs> So if I share the street view, right, so I'm on the uh, the road frontage and yeah. that appears to me to be possibly the power line that is going across in yeah. part the site and this is the site uh, and the site goes behind those trees. Um, I would say that that power line would be affected by both the proposal that's been approved and the proposal before you in some way or another and it might be a private matter for the developer of the site to have to deal with the utilities uh, an alteration to that power line or not uh, um, but that would be there for their authority to decide okay. does that help yeah that's we're not going to get better than that so thank you and i think your point is valid that i mean we can all see it goes across the previous and the proposed uh, application so it'll be up to us to to weigh that in thank you very much for sharing that okay Obviously, please bear that with the mind that it's a google street view image and exactly. uh, that, that, yeah that, we take that exactly. on board yeah and it thank could you. be it could be out of date but uh, the, the, we could see those wires um in some of the photos that were taken by uh, alex scott as well okay so members uh, council master do you have a question or did you want to come in to be the first in the debate uh I wanted to come back on the power lines, actually, yes. okay. uh, because I uh, subsequently since I asked my question, I have looked at Google aerial view and you can actually see if you blow it up enough, you can see where the the one at the back of the site is. And if I sort of roughly draw a straight line between that pylon, if you like to say, and the one in the back of the garden of the house just to the north, I would say that the new position of the dwelling 
is more under the lines than the existing one. But as you say, it presumably is just a private matter for the applicant to deal with. But I think it, it is an issue, but it, it's obviously not a planning issue, maybe. Um, Unless I I'm corrected otherwise, it's an issue for the applicant subject to them getting permission or the existing permission rather than something that's something the committee needs to take into account. It, is that correct? It, would, it is correct. I, it is. It would be um, for the uh, applicant to deal with with, with the uh, utility in question uh, in order to resolve any particular conflict there may be. The, you know, that that's that's a private matter between those two parties. It wouldn't be redeemed to be a planning consideration, in my Thank opinion, you. to give much okay. weight. Thank you. Councillor Field, is it a question you have at this stage or do you want to go into debate? I was just going to comment and presumably it would also involve the health and safety executive because those wires are not exactly uh, person friendly. Yeah. yeah. OK, so members, we've had all the information put before us. It's now up to us to make a proposal uh, and to debate uh, the application before us. Uh, so open it up to members, uh, whoever wants to come in. Councillor Matheson's first off. Yes, thank you. With with um, uh, Councillor Mansell's points about um, biodiversity enhancement, um, I, I I had that down to raise at this later stage. Um, it is it is very disappointing that the original permission did not take up the <clears throat> um, place services who said that they had no objection subject to securing ecological mitigation and enhancement measures, page 73 to 76 of the papers. So if if we if we're minded to approve this, and I, I'm not convinced that we should at the moment, um, I hope that Mr. Scott, Mr. Pateman G will strain every sinew to find ways of bringing those recommendations back into the conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mansfield and Councillor Field. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, now, I am. Um, I, I, I'm seriously disappointed, actually, that, that the previous application was granted permission with or without the biodiversity conditions. Um, and I am really struggling to see why this new application is is presenting more harm than the one that's already got permission. OK, so the other one was at the end of of the garden of um, whatever it's called. Um, Fox Hollow um, and this one is at the end of the garden of Fairhaven. Uh, so it's a different resident who's objecting to having a house behind their back garden. Um, and, and OK, it's not fair on the residents of Fairhaven, but maybe the first one wasn't fair on the residents of Fox Hollow. Um, I'm struggling to see why it's any worse than the original. Um, I, I personally, I think this is not the right place to put a house in the first place. It's quite clearly beyond the edge of the gardens, which sort of form a linear pattern along the Wyverston Street. Um, so. I, I, at the moment, much as I don't like it, and I really wish we could put those biodiversity conditions back in, as, as Councillor Matheson has already mentioned, but I am really struggling as to why this application is any worse than the one that's already got permission. But I just wish that hadn't got permission, but it has. We are where we are, and I, I'd love to hear other people's views on why this is worse than the one that's already got permission. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Councillor uh, Field. OK, I feel I think it's worse than the one that has a permission uh, for a couple of reasons. It does impact on the amenity of, a, as you say, of a different property. In fact, it impacts on the amenity of two properties where it used to be one, <coughs> which seems to be somewhat more detrimental. I do think there's an issue uh, about it opening up the possibility of further developments uh, on this site and, and obviously we shouldn't indulge in imagination and decisions on, on that basis. So uh, I would stick with the reason that I would advocate that we do not approve this 
is because it impacts the uh, amenity of existing residents to improve the amenity of the applicant for the new property. Um, and you know, it, 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 he or she or wherever the applicant decided to, to build, to, to apply for a house in the position that is currently approved and was obviously fully aware of the uh, issues surrounding that at that time. So my view is, uh, and taking the point that perhaps we could debate the, the, the sense of development in this position, at, uh, this area at all, but that has been done. There is an existing uh, approval, uh, which is only two or three months ago. So my view is we should reject this. We should stick with the current layout uh, because of the impact on the amenity of the properties at uh, Field Haven um, and uh, that, that, that that's that's where we should remain. I do think the I impact on the power lines is another issue. It's probably not, as you say, a planning issue, but clearly um, they would they would they transit the site. They would undoubtedly be closer to the house in its new position. Uh, and there are a number of uh, issues re result, uh, re around that, including the, the possibility if you had to move those lines, lift their height or whatever it is, it would be um, a problem to the everyone supplied via that uh, route. Um, and indeed, there are the views from, of many that there are problems if you build dwellings too close to power lines. So that's something that should be discovered. But I, I would recognise that those are not planning issues per se that we should take, give us high weight. It's the immunity issue that concerns me. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Councillor Passmore. Um, thank you, Matthew. Well, um, interestingly, this is another tricky one. And I was initially minded to think, well, why do we need to change anything at all? But having listened to the arguments, um, actually, I don't entirely agree with my good friend John, John Field on this. Hence my question earlier regarding the distance from other properties. So I can't see that it makes a great deal of difference. So I'm not sure there's a rational reason, given that we're only asked to look at this variation of the condition. We've got to stick to what we're asked to look at and what we have to do. So I'm happy to propose that uh, we do grant permission. The other thing I just, this is a bit of a question actually, if I may, Chair. On the recommendations on page 60 of our report, it does talk about the removal of permitted development rights. And I do think that's important because I think there is a degree of nervousness amongst all of us that if you move a site back, well, then you stick another couple of houses in front. But I'm assuming that the removal of permitted development rights would mean that couldn't happen unless you sought to permission to make it much more difficult. So that reassures me. And whilst we can't impose this as a condition, I absolutely agree with everybody else's comments regarding biodiversity. Um, and I would also say, well, perhaps uh, to the planning uh, officers, do everything you can to work with the applicant should permission be granted to make sure that those concerns are properly addressed and not just a sort of token, well, here's a bat box and that'll do. So um, I think that's a very important point, but I accept we can't add that as a condition because we're looking at one thing. So I'm actually formally proposing um, approval of this with those other caveats. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Councillor Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Um, does this affect the amenities of the two houses more than the original? Fox Hollow is two storey. Um, Field Haven is a bungalow. So I think you could make a case that by moving it back, Fox Hollow's um, views are improved uh, and field haven how much would it be affected um, there's a large hedge between hedges can be removed so i'm not sure that um, we can make a case for um, the amenities being um, reduced i do struggle with moving it at all i look at the plans and uh, to my mind the the original position is a far better position having visited the site um, the, the, it's very flat how much would the view be improved? So whilst my personal opinion would be to remain with the original one, I can't I can't see a reason for refusing um, the application. So I think on that basis, I'm happy to um, second the proposal that's been put forward. Thank you very much. OK, I don't have any other hands up. I mean, I'll just add my thoughts. I mean, again, um, 
the amenity issue is a really difficult one because you're moving it from one to another. Uh, of course, to the uh, to the uh, resident that's being represented by Mr. Horn, to them this this will be uh, uh, you know be uh, something they don't want to see. And it's a, it's a, that they're going to feel some of the impact versus other people are going to get less impact. But you know, for us, um, in terms of the wider uh, impact of the amenity, I think actually. You know there is a good distance between the two. Um, although I do understand the the you know the residents' concerns, but I'm not sure that's a strong enough reason for re for refusing this. And the point that Councillor Mellon makes, I absolutely agree. Of course, um, when one looks at planning applications, one always considers about what this may impact and what what could come forward after it. But I'm afraid today we can only look at what is before us and the application before us, and not. Uh, not the wider, you know, that this may lead to other applications. That's really not what's before us today. What's before us today is just what's in the papers, and that is all we can consider. So while I can see the frustrations of the neighbour and understand Councillor Mellon's concerns, um, I can't really find any reason uh, as to why I would be able to refuse uh, this application. So uh, my view is I, I will support it, but I can see the reasons why people are concerned. Uh, oh, Councillor Mansell, your hands come up. Uh, if I'm allowed to come back, um, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I'd just like to, I mean, I, I, for once, actually, Councillor Hicks, I, I actually probably agree with you. Maybe that's a surprise, but um, I'd just like to come back on the on the, cum the aspect that mention of cumulative development that has been picked up. I personally don't see that this new layout makes it any more likely than before. The, the blue line ownership is the whole of that field. They could come back and ask to knock the, the metal shed down or whatever it is and put five more houses in there. They could have done that before. I don't think that actually makes any difference. And, and, and I agree that, you know, we can't we can't look to the future. And, and as I've said before, I really can't see why this is any worse than the other one. I don't like it. I didn't like the other one, but it's no worse, really. Thank you. OK, we have Councillor Field, then I think we'll go to the vote. Councillor Field. Thank you for letting me return for a second. I, I was just going to point out, unless the officer tells us otherwise, I don't think removal of permitted development rights impacts uh, on potential further housing development. It would prevent people shifting windows in houses or putting yeah, an outbuilding garden, yeah. but, but it, it's nothing else of substantial weight. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, John, do you just want to clarify that or Alex, just clarify. Permitted development right is about outbuildings and further extending of the house, isn't it, rather than a new house coming in? Uh, yes, uh, luckily uh, a new house still needs planning permission of some sort. Uh, yeah. So in, in all respect, that would require a separate application in any event. Yeah, exactly. OK, thank you. OK, as we have now other speakers, we've had it proposed by Councillor Passmore and seconded by Councillor Mayer. So I'll now, uh, for the recommendation as laid out on page 59 uh, and uh, 60 of our papers, but I'll just hand over to the Chief Planning Officer just to confirm the proposal and then ask the Governance Officer to conduct a roll call. Uh, yes, I, I, I can confirm that essentially uh, what we're here doing is varying uh, condition two. So updating the plan details to accord to the layout presented to members and all other conditions would remain in effect and therefore we would be uh, issuing a, 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 an application on that basis. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, thank you. So oh. now I'll carry out the roll call, please. Thank, thank you, you, Chair. So if members could please respond as usual with for, against or abstain. So Councillor Rachel Eburn. Four. Councillor John Field. Against. Councillor Matthew Hicks. Four. Councillor Sarah Mansell. Four. Councillor John Matheson. Against. Councillor Richard Mayer. Four. Councillor Dave Muller. Four. And Councillor Tim Passmore. Four. Thank you, Chair. I make that six votes to two, so the motion is carried. Can I just confirm with Mr. Dupre? I, I agree, six votes to two, motion carried. Thank you, Chair. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Um, do we have any site inspection requests that need to be reported to the committee, please? No, Chair. No. OK, so I now formally close the meeting at 12 o'clock. Thanks, everyone, for joining us uh, and we close the meeting.